and welcome to iBuzz. I'm your host, Nasheen Bukhari, bringing you the latest and most exciting news from entertainment world. In today's episode, we will be discussing Anthony Mackie defending Shakari Richardson and Naomi Osaka, followed by a movie review on Dark Knight Rises. First things first, let me quickly take you to the top stories of the day. Anthony Mackie defended Shakari Richardson and Naomi Osaka in ESPY Awards speech. Justin Bieber performs three Las Vegas shows in 24 hours. Kevin Feige breaks down MCU Phase 4 movies and TV shows in new video. Kristen Stewart's Princess Diana drama Spencer to premiere at Venice Film Festival. And Barack Obama's 2021 summer playlist features Pakistani artist Aruj Aftab. And now moving to the top story of the day. Hollywood star Anthony Mackie has stepped ahead to defend American athlete Shikari Richardson and Japanese tennis champ Naomi Osaka. To discuss the story, we are joined by TV producer Charlie David Page. Charlie, welcome to the show. Hi again, Nasheen. How are you doing? Thanks, Charlie, for joining us. It is really good to see the amount of support athletes are receiving from Hollywood, especially in recent years. What do you have to say for this trend? Look, I think this only goes to prove the point that uh, at the end of the day, sport is just another form of entertainment. And uh, it's great that we're seeing that combination of support both from uh, within the sporting community and outside of it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's fantastic that Anthony Mackie would get up mm -hmm. behind these two sporting stars as somebody who's one of the most, uh, or becoming one of the most recognizable faces on the planet mm -hmm. and is, is really putting that, uh, that important uh, support behind them, you know, it, especially for Naomi Osaka. It's one of those uh, situations where um, it's very clear that she's very much in the right and that uh, mm -hmm. and that the more support that we can give, not just sporting stars, but everybody with mental mm -hmm. health is, is vital. Now, there are very mixed opinions about Anthony Mackie defending Shakari Richardson when it was declared by American track officials that she will not be included in the Olympics. What is your take on, on these mixed reviews? I mean, some are in favor and some are not. So what do you think of that? Look, I think at the end of the day, this is a tricky one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think Anthony Mackie's comments uh, that she was taking a dehancing drug um, um, yeah. are probably quite accurate. But at the end of the day, she is applying to compete in the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. There are rules that you do need to follow to be an athlete at the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So um, whatever you're feeling on the use of marijuana, it's it's very much a situation where you have to say, look, they, they very clearly state that you can't use marijuana whilst competing. So it's, it's, it's probably a bit cut and dried there, but certainly in support of whether or not those rules should, should mm -hmm. change, I think that should be the ongoing question now. Right, and it's a blend of feelings with reality. I mean, uh, Anthony Mackie needed to separate the feelings from reality here. It's about a healthy competition and the health of athletes where they set example for other players. I don't think they just set examples for other players. I think they set example for anyone who's watching this sport mm -hmm. as well. So it's 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 even more vital, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially from the uh, Osaka side of things, uh, going back to the French Open where she was talking about the fact that uh, she was really uneasy fronting the press and speaking, yeah. in, uh, especially when talking about losses. Um, you know, that, that would be a struggle for anyone to kind of go home after a bad day True. and say, oh, you know, I've, I've got to now sit here and analyze every mm -hmm. single little detail. You know, I don't think you or I would like to do that at our dinner table, let alone mm. do it in front of, uh, you know, an audience of potentially millions around the world. So. I think that uh, Naomi Osaka has really done the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, she's clearly proven that uh, she can pull her weight as mm -hmm. the world number one tennis player uh, on the women's side of things. 
and and, and really prove mm-hmm. the point that like she's not going to be bullied into into going to these media conferences um, just because they want to find her fifteen thousand dollars. She's very happy to pull out of a tournament in mm-hmm. order to you know, make sure that her mental health comes first and foremost. True, true. And Charlie, on the other hand, Olympic Games are all about the athletes themselves, the performers. So if they are supported by their fellows from the entertainment industry, uh, this means it's it's a good news that their issues are understood and highlighted, unlike the management in sports, who are, you know, responsible to do the same kind of thing for their athletes. So what is your take on that? I think at the end of the day, that really exemplifies that, you know, stars, whether they be sporting, uh, mm-hmm. music, uh, film, they're just people at the end of the day. You know, mm-hmm. we all have bad days. We all go through things. This, yes. and, and there's no reason, reason that uh, you and I mm-hmm. feel any differently than those people up on the big screen or, or on the sporting uh, court or field. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just really important to remember that they're everyday people as well and that they're not superheroes a little bit like anthony mackie is but certainly um that we just need to respect and understand them and and know that their mental health is worth more than a lot of money which is what those sporting organizers and and sponsors Mm -hmm. seem to be uh concerned about correct and charlie about uh naomi osaka uh it was obvious that she was fined for wrong reasons and Anthony Mackie is probably the first one from the entertainment industry to show his support for these ladies publicly in an event where he was making a speech in favor of these ladies. Do you think that these kinds of steps uh, will will make a difference, uh, especially for women athletes? I think it'll make a huge difference across Mm -hmm. the board. You know, uh, we still need to go a long way when it comes to talking about mental health. Um, and I think bringing, bringing it to the public attention is really the number one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Naomi Osaka really did that um, during the French Open. She really made a, a big push to make sure that all athletes, not just her, but all athletes are heard from it. And I think that Anthony Mackie's comments uh, mm-hmm. today were really fantastic. <clears throat> I'd, I'd just love to read what he actually had to say about it. Um, if my sport had one of the most popular and marketable athletes on the planet, you know what I would do? I'd probably mm-hmm. make sure she felt comfortable and respected. Mm-hmm. But hey, right. what do I know? I'm just Captain America. <laughs> yes. And Charlie, the real reason behind Osaka's cancelling her press conference was the pressure she was dealing with at that time. Something similar happened with Serena Williams, uh, as well as in the entertainment industry. Britney Spears is our latest example. So in your opinion, why this biggest factor in a celebrity's life is overlooked most of the times? I think we assume that just because they're a celebrity, just because they're famous, that they're accessible 24-7. Um, and that's clearly not the case. You know, We need to be able to give these people, again, these everyday regular people, mm-hmm. um, time and space to themselves. We need to make sure that they're looked after mentally as well as physically. You know, if you were on the tennis court and you hurt your ankle, well, of course you wouldn't have to, you know, yeah. deal with a barrage of questions about it. You wouldn't have to deal with all that. So why is mental health viewed in, in, in a different way? It's it's mm-hmm. really important that we kind of look at these things and say, okay, there are going to be times when everyone needs their own space. And it's really important. And uh, let's respect that. Right. And Charlie, Anthony Mackie received a little back on social media where he was criticized for supporting uh, Shakiri. They said that Anthony seemed to be in support of normalizing drug usage for the athletes. What is your take on that? I guess that really depends where in the world you're from. Um, mm-hmm. Here in Australia, it's certainly a very much a gray area mm-hmm. in the use of marijuana, though it has been uh, approved for medical use. Certainly mm-hmm. in the US, uh, things are a lot freer. Um, it's almost you know, expected that mm-hmm. uh, marijuana is readily available uh, in most places for medical reasons. Um, so it's really, it comes down to that idea of uh, where Mm-hmm. You're allowed to use marijuana in sporting events going forward. Um, that's going to be the big question that we really need an answer to. But at the moment, as mm-hmm. I say, the rules very much state you cannot be uh, testing positive for THC uh, whilst you are an Olympic athlete, full stop, wherever you are in the world. So that's kind of where we sit at the moment. Mm-hmm. And another unpopular opinion is that such bans, fines and verdicts are given and highlighted in the media only when they're about women people of color or people from different ethnicity. 
So what would you have to say about that? I don't necessarily know if that is the case, but I would say that it does seem to be rather more mm. prevalent. And I think maybe the situation is uh, less about the, the fact that it's being highlighted when it's uh, with people of a, a different you know, skin color or, um, or for females, but rather that they are the ones who are more affected by these rules. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it certainly would be said that uh, straight white men probably uh, get away with things a little bit easier in the sporting world. Um, you know, it's still very much mm -hmm. considered a bit of a masculine uh, domain. So I think that they probably get a, a little bit more leeway in that regard. So hence why you might find that uh, that more women are having to stand up for themselves, whether it be something as simple as mental health, whether it be about pay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the same can be said about, you know, uh, those, uh, you know, different areas mm -hmm. of the sport, including stars who do have a different, you know, skin color or, or, or do come from certain parts of the world. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's a little bit tougher for those people to to kind of mm -hmm. stand there and say, hey, you know, I should be on the playing field as well. Mm -hmm. Right, and Charlie, uh, Anthony Mackey's uh, action should be really appreciated. I mean, he really, you know, came out of his comfort zone using the platform for the right kind of expression. So, uh, what is your opinion on that? I think what, what we really saw today was the first real breakdown between the sporting world and mm -hmm. the film world, and that that coming together, you know, I, I mean, the ESPYs are really a mm -hmm. celebration of the top sporting people and teams around the world. Um, so it was really fantastic to see him kind of step up and say, hey, these are actual issues that are being dealt with across the world at the moment. You know, this this isn't just uh, one country or another, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's issues that are being seen in the US, it's issues that are being seen in, in France, clearly mm -hmm. Japan, um, even here in Australia, and I, I'm sure there as well. So it's really tricky to kind of get that support behind you. But I think now that Anthony Mackie has kind of stood up and done this, mm -hmm. we're going to see a lot more of it from uh, across the board in the entertainment sector. Right. Charlie, it was great discussing this with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you much, That was Charlie Page with his views on the top story. And now moving to other story details of the day. Justin Bieber tripled up in Las Vegas over the weekend, performing three shows in two days. The singer was the guest of honor for the multi-day opening festivities of Delilah at Wynn, Las Vegas, and hit the stage three times within 24 hours at various venues located at Wynn. His first gig was on Friday at the Encore Theatre, featuring an 18-song set, during which the kid Leroy joined the headliner for their new song, Stay. MCU architect Kevin Feige breaks down Phase 4's movies and TV shows thus far. Marvel Studios was forced to delay kicking things off with its new stories after wrapping up the Infinity Saga due to the pandemic. But now that it is back with a string of projects out and several more in the pipeline, Feige looks back on how this fresh chapter is shaping up for the franchise. Pablo Lorraine's highly anticipated drama Spencer starring Kristen Stewart as Lady Diana will world premiere in competition at the Venice Film Festival. Written by Peaky Blinders creator Stephen Knight, the film centers on a weekend in the early 1990s when Diana decided to separate from Prince Charles amid rumors of affairs. The film comes out in 2022 to mark the 25th anniversary of Diana's death. Former President of the United States of America, Barack Obama, shared his annual summer playlist on Saturday. Among prominent artists' track, the playlist also includes a famous Urdu ghazal performed by Pakistani artist Aruj Aftab. The famed Pakistani musician Aruj thanked Obama for including her song Muhabbat in his summer playlist. Taking to her Instagram handle, the singer thanked the former president and also expressed her excitement for appearing in the list of Obama's favorite songs. That's all from our newsroom. We will be right back after a quick short break with a movie review. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. In this segment, we will be reviewing the famous Batman sequel, Dark Knight Rises. Bane, an imposing terrorist, attacks Gotham City and disrupts its eight-year-long period of peace. This forces Bruce Wayne to come out of hiding and don the cape and cowl of Batman again. Directed by Christopher Nolan, this epic Batman sequel made 1.81 billion US dollars in box office in 2012. To review the movie, we have TV presenter and film critic Alice Oliver with us. Alice, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. So Alice, Gotham City is always under attack, but this time it's lethal. Uh, what are your thoughts, What your initial thoughts when you, you've seen this movie? I, I really thoroughly enjoyed this film. I thought they had such a huge task ahead of themselves, Christopher mm. Nolan and the cast really, to sort of live up to the expectations that had been put out there because of The mm -hmm. Dark Knight, which obviously was so well received and people loved that so much. Mm -hmm. It was always going to be challenging to try and finish off this trilogy in a way that would have mm -hmm. the desired impact and kind of leave the audiences satisfied. And I think they did such a good job. I think Bane as a villain is yeah. just brilliant. And Tom Hardy, I think, is a pheno phenomenal actor. He's one of these actors who, if he's in something, I will watch it. And it's the same for Christian Bale, actually. Yeah. Um, so I thought Bane was a really brilliant villain. And he's not, um, sort of what he wants isn't necessarily evil. You know, he wants mm -hmm. to sort of get rid of the corruption in Gotham. He wants to give more power to, you know, people who have been downtrodden, maybe wrongfully imprisoned. Uh, yeah. It's just that he goes about it in a very destructive and violent way. Absolutely. And talking about Tom Hardy, he, he seemed to be the center of gravity throughout the movie with his remarkable performance. So much so that at many points, a viewer almost forgets that the movie is about Batman and not Bane. Oh, yeah, I, I would certainly agree. And mm. I would I would want more Bane content. And I would, <laughs> you are rooting for him a little bit. And, and he's just mm. so kind of brilliantly and effortlessly evil, I think. Yeah. Um, and the mask kind of really adds an element of horror Absolutely. to him because he is he's just a man. He is yeah. just a man. This is the interesting thing with Batman villains is they are just people. You know, they're not superheroes. They're not from other planets. Absolutely. Um, but he looks quite monstrous because he's so big. You know, we know Tom Hardy mm. loves the gym and got himself yeah. so, so big to, to really play the part of fame. Mm. Um, and just visually, he's so striking. And then with that, you know, quite sort of maniacal mm. voice that comes out from under the mask. Right. And the movie blew audiences away with its towering IMAX photography and cinematic realism. I think this is something which makes the movie stand out. And it was indeed a very impressive visual achievement. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. This was the first film that I saw in IMAX. And I mm -hmm. do think it is part of the reason why I love the film so much, because when you experience something like that, it just has oh the impact is just extraordinary like you've got nowhere else to look like the mm -hmm. whole wall is filled up you know from top to bottom the sound that comes out of it is astonishing and i know that so much work went into it to make it appropriate for a, an imax screen and you know that was something that christopher nolan was quite interested mm -hmm. in um, but yeah visually spectacular you get so many different locations uh, it's such a great use of kind of drones and aerial mm -hmm. shots and like these vast vast landscapes and then all the destruction that happens in Gotham and how they kind of, you know, make that so dramatic and so terrifying. There's lots going on underground, which mm. I'm sure is like really difficult to, to try and film, you know, whether you're in this sort of designed set to make it look underground or if you're able yeah. to kind of get these underground locations or whatever. I imagine that's really difficult. And mm. there was just so much going on and such a, mm -hmm. such a visual pleasure, I think. And definitely, this was definitely one for the cinema. This was just like a perfect film to see in the cinema. Uh, the critics also criticized Anne Hathaway's character, saying that her character was unnecessary. I mean, either the script could not justify her presence or she herself could not, you know, put that sort of power in, into her character. Uh, what is your take on that? I think that's a bit harsh. I, I mm -hmm. certainly wouldn't say that her character didn't have purpose. You know, we needed, mm -hmm. she's kind of like this perfect go-between. Um, between Bane and Batman mm -hmm. because you're not really sure whose side she's on. Ultimately, yes. she's on her own side. She needs to get what she wants out of the situation mm -hmm. and whether that means working for Bane or sort of buddying up with Batman. That mm -hmm. could change, you know, from time to time. But she is the one who, who gets Batman to Bane. Like, mm -hmm. she draws him sort of down underground and sort of leads him into this trap and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would definitely disagree with what the critics are saying there. And I think she gave a really good performance. And she's so mm -hmm. physical in it as well. Like she does, 
and um, you know she does so many of these action sequences and yes. you know she's jumping out of windows all, mm. all you know wearing high heels and skin tight yes. <laughs> leather costume i think that was really impressive <laughs> and probably quite challenging Right. And Alice, this was a wrap up for Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy. In your opinion, as a film critic, do you think that it was wrapped up in a very satisfying manner? It was, it was always going to be challenging to wrap mm -hmm. up this story and wrap up those characters. Uh -huh. The only thing for me, and this was something that I felt at the time when I watched it, was I wasn't completely satisfied that mm -hmm. it turned out that Miranda was the child who yes. was born in the pit and born into darkness. Mm -hmm. Because all the way through, the reason that I get so invested in Bane mm -hmm. is because you just think of him as this kind of, this pure evil who was born, you know, he says, I was born in the darkness, I was molded by it and all, all this. So then at the end, when you actually find out that Miranda is Ra's al Ghul's child and, and mm -hmm. she's the one who was born in the pit, that was a little bit unsatisfying for me. And I would have preferred for that to not happen. Uh -huh. um, but apart from that, it, I think it did wrap up nicely and you know it's mm -hmm. a little bit cheesy at the end when Alfred yeah. sees um, Bruce Wayne and um, Catwoman you know in, in you know in this lovely little cafe just having a nice time but it mm -hmm. it concludes it then it, it's like a that's a full stop it, it's not leaving open kind of these more doors you know it's not mm -hmm. it's not Batman like looking longingly at his mask or his cape or his cave thinking oh maybe I will get back into this it wraps it up nicely and you can imagine in your head that Catwoman mm -hmm. and Batman you know, go off to live yes. just a happy, calm life away from Gotham. Right. And Alice, um, uh, this movie was the first one to be made, first Batman sequel to be made after its predecessor in 2008. Uh, so Christopher Nolan tried to, you know, put the best into it, especially by adding Bruce... Um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase this. So Alice, uh, when Christopher Nolan made this movie, you know that uh, Batman sequel, this was the first Batman sequel after its pre predecessor in 2008. So Christopher Nolan tried his best with the cast and the story both. So do you think when Batman is in Christopher Nolan's hands, it's, it, it seems to be very different and very strong as compared to being directed by other directors? So uh, I do think that. I am mm -hmm. a big fan of Christopher Nolan. I think he's an incredibly talented director. I think he's incredibly ambitious. He's also a good writer as well, and he, he is able to construct a story, yeah. even stories that are sort of familiar to us, but does it in a different way, in a darker way. Mm -hmm. So I know he drew from sort of several iterations of Batman's sort of timeline from the comic books. You know, he picked different parts of it to create this story. And when you think back to the Batman films that were in the 90s, or even, you know, the Batman television show that was out decades ago, they were all just a bit more like silly, a bit more lighthearted. Yes. They didn't quite have the darkness hmm. to it. And I think what Nolan did was just very impressive. And with all the villains that he created as well and the way he created them, because there's such a risk of the Joker, for instance, yes. becoming silly, becoming quite a sort of a silly character who you mm -hmm. might laugh at. But obviously, you know, what he did with Heath Ledger, just, you know, absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. and brought this absolute darkness to it. And um, so I think Nolan, I, I do think he is very capable and I think he's just brilliant at bringing something extra to these characters that we already know. Mm -hmm. And Tom Hardy, you know, he gave his best. When it comes to Heath Ledger, everybody says that there was a full stop to best of the villains in, in Batman. After he died, you know, no, pe people started thinking that, you know, who could take over uh, his place. But Tom Hardy, you know, he did the best of justice to his, him being a villain in this uh, sequel. And I think after that, there was no, not such a great duo received uh, in, in Batman sequels. Even after that, the Batmans that we, we saw, Batman versus Superman, that was an epic fail. So uh, what do you think of the duo that appeared in this movie, uh, Christian Bale and uh, Tom Hardy? Yeah, I mean, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I know I, I did sort of say it already, but they are two actors that if they're in mm -hmm. something, I will watch it. I just think they're brilliant. Tom Hardy, for me, is one of the most committed actors mm -hmm. I've ever seen like when he when he's performing he is performing mm -hmm. with his entire body yes. so w well which would especially make it hard with the mask but when you see him in other films he uses his eyes he uses his mouth he uses his posture the way he walks the way he talks he mm -hmm. can completely change everything about himself so to then even be able to bring Bane to life in such mm -hmm. a way whilst he hasn't got the use of his face in that mm -hmm. same way it's all about the eyes it's all about his physicality yeah. you know we see him often like holding his big collar up like this 
and he's just got this ominous kind of towering presence because he's so huge. Uh, but I do think Tom Hardy is fabulous. And but Chris, Christian Bale as well, so committed. You know, you mm. see him going from film to film, the drastic weight loss and weight gain that he's, you know, willing to do for these yeah. roles, you know, the workout regime he must have to stick to. And he, again, he's just always so committed. Like, you're not looking at Christian Bale when yes. he's acting. You're looking at whoever his character is. And something that you, you lose that a lot of the time with some actors where you just mm -hmm. feel like you're watching them in a different scenario. It's like, no, I'm just seeing that actor mm -hmm. in this different location. Mm -hmm. But with Bale and with Hardy, they become their characters completely. And I think they just always give just these really stellar performances. Right, absolutely. Uh, Alice, thank you very much indeed. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much. That was Alice Oliver reviewing Dark Knight Rises. And that is it from today's episode. We hope you liked it. Don't forget to share your feedback on the social media link mentioned down below. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care and goodbye.